Are you hungry for a new career? Maybe you'd like to join the great resignation and quit your job or start a company or rewrite your life script. If so, I'm looking out for you. And that's why I'm talking to Kim Perel, entrepreneur, investor, best-selling author, her new book, Jump, Dare to Do What Scares You in Business and Life. Hi, Kim. Hi, I'm so excited to be here today. Uh, terrific. It's really nice seeing you, and I love the book. Uh, so many terrific career advice tips, uh, especially for entrepreneurs, but I guess anyone really, Kim, who's looking to make that leap or jump into something new, whether it is leaving a company for another company or another field uh, or starting a new company. I guess there's a broad base of people who are going to make the jump, as you say. Is that right, Kim? Yeah, the book really it is for entrepreneurs, but it's also for anyone that wants to make a big life change, whatever mm. that may be. And I think that's either professionally or personally. I mean, right now we're doing a jump challenge and it's so exciting to see the different types of jumps people want to make. So not only start a business or get a new job, but it's also honestly like lose weight, get financial freedom. Um, you know, something yeah. more physically that they want to overcome and or they want to jump into. So it's great to see there's a very large amount of people that want to make change. Kim, as you know, I write books and columns on presentation and communication skills. You have a very impressive background that I think is very appropriate. There's something we could all learn. You were broke at the age of 23. 10 years later, you're a self-made millionaire. You sold your last company for $235 million. Since then, you're an investor. You have personally invested in over 100 startups. Mm -hmm. So tell us from your perspective, you've been on both sides now. If someone has an idea that they want to turn into a reality, what are you looking for in a pitch or a presentation? Yeah, so for me, you know, it really comes back to, I, I am an entrepreneur. And so I, and I've gone through the journey and the reason I invest is because it's hard and entrepreneurship is hard and it's lonely, it's scary. All these feelings that you have when you make that jump into it. And that's why I invest in startups because I really believe if I can help other individuals overcome some of those doubts and fears and knowledge and understanding of how to, you know, to create, you know, it'd been a lifesaver for me. So when I look at founders, cause I'm an early stage investor, I think it's really important. Like I invest almost, you know, usually pre-revenue mm -hmm. and those are risky bets, right? An angel investor is a risky, uh, it's a risky investment. And, but I love it because number one, it's usually the founder that has this big vision not as it is today, but how the world could be. And so I love looking at individuals that have that vision, like this crystal clear, clear vision, because I've been there and I had that too. And everyone told me I was crazy. It's not going to work out. Why it's not going to work. You know, I've been there. Like I literally have heard all this before. And so finding someone that believes in you and believes in your vision is really important, especially early on. And so I number one, invest in people. I mean, at this point, it literally at pre-revenue companies, you're, it's an idea and it's a founder. Yeah. And it's how do you bring it to life? And so you're, you know, honestly, you're betting on people is number one. Obviously the market opportunity has to be there. Like I have to believe, and usually I invest in technology. So, or technology that fuels businesses, but you have to believe in this opportunity, but then can this individual actually bring it to life? Cause that's mm -hmm. the hard part. It's easy to dream. It's very hard to do. But how can I get that across to someone like you in a conversation? or in a presentation? How do we get it across? I think number one is being able, and I'm on entrepreneur elevator pitch. So, and I love it because it's true. You need to be able to get it across to me, the market opportunity, why you're the one that's going to make this dream happen and how I, as an investor, I'm going to get my investment back in less than 60 seconds. So it's really about how are you able to clearly articulate that in a very short amount of time that I want to hear more. Can I dive into that just for a moment, Kim? Because I, I've, I've seen you on, on television judging these pitch competitions. The 60-second rule. I understand that for television, it makes sense. 
But do you think it also applies to any type of pitch or presentation? Obviously, we're going to be talking for more than 60 seconds about any idea or company. Why is 60 seconds so important? It's the hook. So you're not going to, I'm not going to make an investment after 60 seconds. That's crazy. Sure. But you definitely should be able to sell me your dream, whatever that dream is. Like I need to be able to feel, I need to feel the passion in you. I need to know and like have this, you can tell, like, I believe like now I have a very good track record of betting on people, but you can see the individuals, like they're not going to give up when it gets hard, when the challenges come, when the setbacks come, like there's this energy that you get from them. And you can see that I think in 60 seconds. Yeah. Let's talk about a mindset that is critical for anyone who has an idea or who wants to make that jump from where what they're doing now to where they imagine themselves to be. And that mindset in your book is optimism. That's the one that mostly resonates with me. You say your mindset is the most important predictor of success and happiness in your life. Change your mindset, change your life. And optimism, you say, is a choice. I believe that, but let's explain that because I think it it is a critical thing for entrepreneurs and for leaders or aspiring leaders to understand. There is a difference between optimism and what you call like just blind happiness. Can you explain the difference? Because obviously you've had to have a lot of optimism in your setbacks. Yeah, I think for me, it's the belief that in the end it will work out, right? So no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad it gets, and honestly, it's been bad and I've been there and I've been, to your point, like I've been broke. I've been, you know, my company's gone bankrupt. I've had, I've hit the rock bottom, but I still had this belief that it could get better. It's a belief in not only that it can get better, but also you have to believe in yourself. And so really, even if it's the worst time, right? And so mm-hmm. it's, you're still optimistic. I think it's different. It's not, I'm not saying don't be realistic because you have to be like, if it's bad, it's bad, yeah. but you believe it can be better. And that pulls you through. Kim, you say you've had your share of setbacks and there's a section in your book where you say, I've been laid off, I've been broke, I've been bankrupt, I've been criticized, I've been rejected, I've been doubted, I've lost my biggest clients, I've lost my best employees, I've lost business partners, and I've had times when I was terrified, exhausted, and wanted to give up. Did you give up? No, that's how I got here. (laughs) And that's the point. It's you, you, you acknowledge all of the setbacks, but you can still be optimistic. And I think people have a hard time with that. Uh, let's face it, between you and me, we know optimism gets a bad rap. And yet, out of all of the entrepreneurs who I've had the pleasure of, of meeting or studying or writing about, the most successful ones are more optimistic than average. Uh, do you think there's something to that? Or am I just a confirmation bias? Maybe I'm just self-selecting and looking for those people to surround myself by. I'm not quite sure. But it, no. it is something that I have noticed in my own uh, career writing about entrepreneurship. I, I 100% agree. Successful individuals or entrepreneurs are optimistic because you have to be. It's hard. So if you're not optimistic, you'll never you know, you'll give up. And that's, like, that's a challenge. And I also think it's looking at, it's not where you came from, it's where you're going. So it's like, I'm always future focused. I'm always like, where am I going? Not what happened to me, because I've had a lot of bad things happen. But the, you know, looking towards the future. And that's why, you know, just keep, keep moving forward one step at a time. And it's really, it served me very well. I mean, at this point, one jump at a time, I'd say, but that ability to move forward, despite Everything mm-hmm. I write about in, you know, in my book, I talk about the critics, like the critics, the dream killers, the naysayers, the ones that tell you like they're definitely not optimistic. And now they're self-imposing their own fears and their own life's experiences on you. And this is not, I, and I write about it, like that's not your yours to take on. Yeah, it, it's a very dangerous mindset. And that's why I don't think we can uh, r- write and talk enough about this subject and this mindset, because I have seen so many people be held back because of others, either what they're hearing on social media, we'll talk about that, that could be catastrophic, uh, or what they hear from friends or families, the naysayers, the critics, uh, 
or where they are in their in their lives and they try to find other role models and maybe they don't have them and it become it becomes self-fulfilling when you get into that negative cycle so let's talk about the five ways to retrain our brains to be more optimistic here are strategies that you've used in your own life and the reason why they resonate with me is because i i, I try to use them as well and because i've studied behavioral psychology I see how they resonate with, uh, well, with what we know about how the mind works. So let's go through your five strategies. Number one, practice positive self-talk. This is critical, but be specific. What do you mean by positive self-talk? I'm sure you're not just talking about looking at yourself in the mirror and saying, everything's great. Everything's great. It's great. <laughs> what do you mean by I positive self-talk? No, but I think for me, it's about, and I do like, look at today's going to be a good day. I'm really grateful for all that I have, like looking at everything in a positive light because it I'm makes I'm bankrupt. It I'm 23 years old. Like you were, you went broke, bankrupt, lost it. And you're going to say and tomorrow, positive self -talk? Be could be, you know, I had tomorrow, I'm alive. Right. Yeah. Like, okay, right. well, could be worse. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think just looking at what is you know, what is in working for you, right? What, is, what do you have? And I really talk to people about that a lot. It's not what you don't have. Why don't you look at what you do have? Like, what are your strengths? What yeah. makes you feel good? And really, I like a highlight reel, like your own little two minute highlight reel of your life of the great things that have happened to you. Because if you play that over and over again, you're training your brain on your success and like that you can do it. And the confidence, it's just constantly hardwired in you. Yeah. The reason why I think these strategies are important and we have to be intentional about them, Kim, is that based on what I've learned about behavioral psychology, we're wired to be more negative mm -hmm. uh, because it served us well when our ancestors were in caves. Uh, we are wired to look for threats. And it that's why I think it's it's a positive thing in your book where we have to rewire. You have to retrain your brain in, in a lot of cases. So let's look at your second strategy. And this is so important. I'd like to hear from you what you mean by this. Curate the media you consume. Mm -hmm. I know how that applies in my life. Uh, I'd like to hear from you. What do you mean by curate the media we consume? Yeah, I believe personally, I mean, whatever you're similar to whatever you're eating, Whatever you put into your whatever you put into your body, that's affecting how you are. Whatever mm -hmm. you're putting into your mind, similar affecting you mentally, right? And I think like that's really important. So I really try to focus on a limiting my social media, just aimlessly scrolling through things that aren't going to mentally increase my you know, happiness or drive or ambition. It's just like, that's not food for you. It's food for your mind, bad food. You should just, I mean, in my opinion, eliminate it, right? Audit it out, don't do it, or at least limit it and make it a point to know, hey, I'm going to spend X amount of time each day, let's just say, yeah, and then cut yourself off. I like <laughs> that. I, I, I like that. Uh, the thing about the social media as well is now we know, now we know that the algorithms are created to feed you posts that will make you anxious or angry or provoke a strong emotion. It, when you're an entrepreneur and you should be 100% focused on, on developing your idea, I'm not sure that's such a good thing. So there's a lot of positive stuff about social media and you and I are both on it, you know, aggressively. We're, we're yeah. social media creatures and we share content and we uh, interact with people. But like you said, be conscious and intentional about what you're feeding yourself. Mm -hmm. well, 100%. Okay, uh, number three, strategy to retrain our mind for optimism. Focus on what you can control. This probably goes back to those 10 years when you were building your company after, after you were broke. There's only so much you can control. Yeah, for me, the only thing that you can control is yourself. Mm -hmm. honestly and your, your mindset mind. that's why we're talking about yeah. mindset right? it's like your mindset your thoughts you can only control you and so and it's hard and i think that just comes back to other people you can't control what other people think what other people do you can only control how you react to it and that mm -hmm. makes it makes a biggest difference so really understanding what you can control which is yourself and letting everything else go because it is so exhausting to and honestly, worry about things you can't control. It's mm -hmm. just a waste. It's a time waster. 
During the pandemic, I spoke to a CEO who was a very much well-admired CEO, very inspirational CEO. And this, uh, uh, she told me that she walked into the staff meeting one day, this was like at the height of the pandemic, maybe April of 2020, uh, March, April, and everybody's anxious, everybody's afraid. And she said, look, I, I don't know when this is going to end. We don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know. And she kind of rattled off all the things they don't know about how it's going to affect the company, what's going to happen. But here's what we can do today. And so she really started, I, th I think it was unintentional. And she realized that it worked very well, that here's what we can control today. And this is why everything you, you and I are talking about today is more about retraining your brain in an intentional way. Because when bad things start happening, they snowball and we get very anxious because we don't know what the outcome is. That's why I think this strategy is, is so important. Focus on what you can control, mm -hmm. not on what you can't. Here's number four. This one is easier said than done. Stop complaining. Oh. That's easy to tell people. <laughs> Honestly, people should do it. just, and I write about it. Have you ever been with that person? If you think about people you really like to spend time with, I think about my grandma, right? She yeah. could, she never complained. And she would, and it doesn't matter what we're doing, what was happening, she just never complained. And it was such a pleasure to be with her, right? So as a young kid, I was like, oh, let's go hang out with Nanny. She's amazing. But she set a great example of always just looking forward, complaining to your point gets into a spiral. It's like a loop. And I feel that, you know, and then people feed off complaining. So really, if you just try one day not to complain, your mindset will shift to things that are positive, that you can control. It actually is a huge, makes a huge difference to yourself and honestly, anyone else you're surrounding yourself with. Yep. And fifth and finally, I love this one, big believer in it, be grateful. So, uh, is it's so much harder though to be grateful when you're faced with so many setbacks. It is hard to be grateful when you're faced with setbacks, but again, what is from if you at least you have your health, hopefully. Mm -hmm. I mean, like some people don't have that. I think it's really yeah. looking at what do you have, what strengths do you have, and focusing on that because. I mean, I'm just so blessed and my kids and we have, we do it every night at dinner, right? We, we talk about what we're grateful for. I mean, in a very mm. kid-like way, but yeah. it, it's really important. Like what's one thing you're grateful for? Just one thing, just think about one thing, whether it be your family, your friends, your, your pet. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm grateful for my dog, right? Like, I mean, there's yeah. just really, that's a little things. I'm grateful it's warm outside. So just finding the little things that you're grateful for, I think makes a big difference. Yeah, my, my parents are Italian immigrants, so they came to America after World War II, and they had nothing. So I, too, was raised with people who were grateful for everything, like every, you know, but they, it was very comical, too. It, it was very much, I'd, do you know what it was like when we were kids in Italy yeah, or during yeah, yeah. World War II? My, bro, my, my father, I was a prisoner in World War II for five years while, you know, at your age. So I heard a lot of those stories as well. But they do remind you that it could be worse. <laughs> it, could, it could be a lot worse. And so, but we have to, again, do that intentionally because we're not really wired to be thinking about what we're grateful all the time because we're constantly fed what's wrong. Right. So yeah, it's like so you true. said, you, you have to talk to the kids or talk to other people and ask them what they're grateful for. Have you ever kept a gratitude journal? Some people do that. Maybe you do something, maybe it's just mental, but uh, I do that mentally. I, I think it's important. Yeah, I do that mentally. I, I think it's worth, it's amazing. I think a lot of people, actually my girlfriend, is here and she's she's got a journal and she's doing it daily which i think is awesome yeah. um i honestly mine's mentally and we do it as a family each day and i think that's really important um i love just that to, you know, to see what your children are grateful for you know because it could be i mean what they're it's so cute right they're yeah. like thankful for yeah. a lego and you're like oh, <laughs> right it's so simple <laughs> but it gets it builds their habit well yeah. kim thank you for giving people the courage to make the jump at any stage in their careers. Thank you so much. It was nice meeting you. It was so great meeting you too. I love it. We have a very similar mindset. Takes practice, right? It does. Thank you. Thanks, Kim.